the idea behind starting this series is actually to um, pretty much expose uh, all the engineers and whoever is actually interested in the company to uh, classical machine learning, statistical modeling, uh, neural networks, deep learning uh, in a very fundamentally uh, you know, pragmatic way. This will include a lot of uh, you know, theoretical concepts, but a whole lot of fundamental mathematics behind it so that you get an understanding as an engineer. And, and if there are other people who are non-engineering who also wants to learn the math behind neural networks, get an idea in terms of what is really happening inside the black box and why is it so powerful compared to any other techniques when you're actually talking about neural networks. And uh, how do you actually think about designing neural networks for everyday engineering you know, tasks if you want to do that, uh, where you have some uh, you know, rules-based uh, uh, you know, logic that you might be writing. And suddenly, if you want to switch to, what would a neural network do? If I want, instead of me actually training this function, if I want to actually throw a neural network or some kind of uh, you know, machine learning algorithm out there without going to applied machine learning, without having to come to uh, you know, a demand intelligence team or AI group, if you want to attempt this yourself, this, uh, this series of lectures is what I'm, I'm hoping will help you from giving you a, a, an idea in terms of the fundamental math behind it. What we intend to cover um, is to understand the motivation behind how, you know, how did the neural networks come to be? Uh, you know, prior to neural networks, uh, you, know, you had uh, other um, you know, machine learning techniques which was heavily based on statistical modeling, but why neural networks? Uh, understand the fundamental setup and architecture of an artificial neural network. And really today we're gonna do some math. I don't know how many people I'm gonna scare off, but some college math, really basic, calculus, nothing, nothing complex, nothing scary. I'm gonna you know, write it down step by step so that it doesn't scare you away. But that math is fundamentally important for you to understand things like gradient descent, vanishing gradient, exploding gradients, what's happening within the black box and so on and so forth. Don't be scared, sit through the math, go back, refresh, you'll be fine. Uh, very quickly, quick show of hands. How many people recognize this picture? What is it? Wow. What about this? Wow, you guys are awesome. How about this? What is it? Fundamentally, your brain is able to pick up something as hazy as a concept like this and able to regurgitate and conceptualize and give a label to each of these pictures. There should be something supremely strong about your brain, which actually allowed you to do this, right? So this was what was, you know, keeping the researchers up all through for the last 60 years, whenever you're talking about artificial neural networks, this is not a concept that's, uh, that's exploded over the last five or 10 years. The concept of perceptrons, the concept of how to, you know, mimic or simulate the brain has been around for 60, 70 years, right? different attempts to structure the brain, different uh, philosophies. Uh, but only in the last 10 years, we had uh, some amount of semblance in terms of how to structure that. How many people can quickly tell me the answer for this? Show of hands. Isabel. <laughs> yeah, I like that answer. The brain, you know, brain is good at doing something so complex about pattern recognition, common sense, Confabulation, white lies, creativity, art. This is actually a simple math function. I'm, 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 not, I'm not lying. If, you, if I give you five to 10 minutes for people who actually know integrals, five minutes you'll be done. But you can, the brain just cannot quickly come up with a solution for this. So the brain is good, actually good at some certain things and it's not good at certain things. We need to find out whether when you replicate the brain, are you actually inheriting the goodness and badness when you're actually looking at neural networks? That's something that we'll figure out. The architecture intelligence, which when, when people started actually looking at the brain as a function, they started trying to understand the structure of the brain. And the brain structure pretty much, if you look at the etching of the brain, it looks something like this. All the neurons are connected. They're, they're connected in a very, uh, when you look at it from outside, it looks like it's connected in a very random haphazard manner. But when you start etching it, you notice, you start noticing some beautiful patterns in terms of layers and layers and layers of neurons all connected in a meaningful manner. 
right? And it's not just uh, the connections, it's also the density. Uh, if you actually look at uh, the largest density of brain neurons, of course, it's in elephants. Humans compared elephants have really one fifth of the total number of neurons, both in the gut as well as in the brain. But it's not really the amount of neuron you have, it's where do you have those neuro neural density. So the, the architecture is based on how each of these neurons is connected, how many neurons you have, and where do you have it. And apparently, the cerebral cortex, as an evolution, is the place where the highest neural density, which probably evolved intelligence, right? Uh, the cerebral density, if you look at humans, I don't know whether you can, uh, you can see it from far, far away, 16 million neurons just in the cerebral cortex compared to elephants, which is 5.6 million. Elephants are really smart, but their cerebral cortex compared to humans is extremely small. So they don't have the language ability and so on and so forth. So there was an attempt for structure replication. So typically the attempt was if somehow I can first replicate the structure of the brain, which is at the very atomic unit, the neuron, and say if a neuron is a processing unit and brain has 86 billion such processing units, right? That's probably larger than the number of stars you have in this Milky Way, right? Each brain has more neurons than the number of stars in the Milky Way. Can you imagine that? Uh, but those are so many processing units. Now, if I connect them all together in some meaningful form and try to also replicate the structure of the brain where you know, there, there, there are chemicals or electrical signals, positive electrical signals excite neurons, negative electrical signals diminish neurons. So it depends on whether you want to activate or de deactivate neurons. And based on the chemical path, there's a neural pathway which develops inside the brain according to the neurological research which builds memory, which builds habits, which builds uh, behavior, which helps you walk, which helps you see, which helps you identify and recognize uh, the picture I just showed you, right? So this was the first attempt. So the structure is you have all these, uh, you know, uh, neurons that actually uh, connect with each other. There, there are weights which actually tells you how these neurons are actually forwarding the information, you amplify the information or you diminish the information. And then there is some kind of a processing unit which it is connected to, which takes the function of the input plus the weight, we'll call it X and W, and some meaningful way to add it up. So we'll just say it's a product, sum of all products, right? We'll come to that. Some meaningful way to actually process that information, apply some more function, some function fx on it, and forward it to the next neuron. So this was the basic stru structure of the setup. Uh, if we could do this, can we now encode common sense? Can we encode patterns? Can we encode information within this neuron to identify cuteness, to identify cats, to identify you know, cats versus dogs, right? If you try to approach this using software 1.0, which is like writing rules to say, how does a cat look like? And trying to write rules for that cat, which is like twisted and we're, you know, literally backward is gonna be extremely hard. You have, you have to write millions and millions and millions of rules, if then logic to say, oh, the ears has to be this length when it's on the side. You know, it, it looks this way when it's turned upside down. Cats are really crazy twisted creatures. It's hard to write rules for a cat and they are really cute. And it's hard to write you know, rules for cuteness, right? So uh, it fundamentally came down to output equals input times some knowledge, right? If I want an output, which is a pattern recognition, a label, some value that you're uh, you know, looking for in terms of uh, the, the value for the math function or a logic, you said there should be some amount of input. The input can be visual input, the input can be 
uh, you know, uh, auditory inputs. The input can be some function that you actually send. The input can be just a click of a button, doesn't matter. There should be some knowledge which actually takes that input, process that knowledge, and provide you that output. If that has to be converted into you know, philosophical or tautological arguments, cat is nothing but the image you see times the catiness, whatever that catiness is. That's the knowledge, right? We don't know what that catiness is. Or if you want a cat label as an output, image can be converted into pixels, which is numerical values. And if this knowledge is some kind of a weight, weights the neural path, every neural pathway that it makes in your brain, let's assume we convert that as the strength between two neuro neurons, and we say that strength is some numerical weight, then that function is what we are trying to emulate over here, saying oh, this complex, there are 86 billion neurons and maybe 16 billion neurons, and each neuron is making a pathway of certain strength, and that is knowledge. Let's assume that's what we are actually trying to uh, you know, uh, codify here. So at the base level, Y is the output, X is the input, W is the weight, right? The objective over here is we do not know what W is. We do not know what the weight is. We do not know how to code that knowledge. We only know the input, which is the total number of pixels. We know what's the expected output, which is the label cat, dog, cute, not cute, hot, not hot, whatever, right? But we need to learn that weight. How do we go about doing this? Uh, let's do a very quick exercise. I'm gonna, I'm gonna think of a number. I'm gonna ask each of you to guess that number. The only input that you're gonna get from me is whether the number you guessed is higher or lower than the number I have, right? So let's start. I have a number in mind. My number is lesser than that. My number is lesser than that. One. My number is higher than that. Right. That's my number. <laughs> what, what just happened? First, I had a number. There was a random guess, right? It doesn't matter. You could have said a million. It doesn't matter. I said my number is higher than that. Did your guess actually go up after that? I mean, that would be stupid, right? If, if you said 100 and I said my number is lesser than that, the other person wouldn't guess 200. You guessed 50. You said some, some, you know, and then I said it's lower than that. Somebody said four, way lower. So this process of trying to guess the number by adjusting based on some information is where finding the knowledge actually is applied in neural networks. We need to find a weight. So let's say I want to label between cats and dogs. X is the cat pixels. Total number of pixels are converted into some numerical inputs, right? Red has a value, blue has a value, green has a value. The combination of all of this has a value. And the end result you want is a label, cat or dog. Cat, let's say it's zero, and dog, let's say it's one. So I want zero or one. The network weights, I do not know. In simple math, I'm saying I have y equals x times w, where I know y is, uh, let's say, the output I'm expecting, the output has a number, let's say 10. The input, the pixels is, let's say, 5, right? I need to guess what, uh, w. Now, in straight arithmetic, you can probably do this, right? You can say 10 divided by 5, so that answer is 2. In straight arithmetic, this is not straight arithmetic. You cannot apply math straight. Instead, there is a small trick. The trick is exactly based on the guess, guessing game that we, 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 we went through, which is, I just want to know the error of the guess that I'm making. So I'll say x times w minus y, right? So if I have 5 times w minus 10, I mean, you know, y is already known, then if somebody guesses the w. If w is 3 over here, the error is 5, correct? So far, so good? The error should come down to 0. That's when you guess the w correctly. So we need an optimization function, which actually constantly keeps correcting the w for us by first making a random guess. It'll say, okay, 10, what's the error? So it'll say five times 10 is 50 minus 10 is 40. 
oh, that's a very high error. Then it'll say minus 20. Oh, that's a negative error. So there should be some function which keeps scaling up and down until error becomes zero. When error becomes zero, your W is found, your knowledge is found, your cattiness is found, your cuteness is found, right? Just by guessing, you can actually encode a lot of things in neural networks. That's the basic premise, just by guessing the weights. Now, stop me whenever you know, I'm going too fast. So far, so good. You, you guys are with me? Now, if E is the error, we just said that learning is the optimization we apply to reduce error E by guessing the weight W. So far, so good. Now, why neural network helps us to achieve this better? Why, why can't we just have one node, like linear regression? That's what it is, you know, logistic regression. That's what they do. Why neural network? The beauty about neural network is think about, let's say, thousands and thousands of small neurons, which are all knobs, all you know, connected in layers. Each of you is, you know, and there's an input that's coming in. There's an output value that's expected. Each of you is allowed to tune the knob a little bit, adjust it a little bit, a little bit, until the end value has zero errors. So you get an input, you're expecting an output, each of you are actually guessing, but you're not guessing one number. You're actually guessing some number for how much you want to you know, tune this knob in such a way that the output is the value that you're expecting. This is called supervised learning. When you're actually training your neural network, you, you first train it with known values. You say, this is the input. This is the output that I'm expecting. What is the state of the network? Like when you actually compute, what is the state of the net network? If the state is not correct, you go and change the knobs a little bit, all the knobs a little bit. Right? If you have 10 knobs, you just change the values of 10 knobs. If you have 100 knobs, you change the values of 100 knobs. And that beauty of actually making minor changes in each of the knob is where the neural network actually learns this function of cattiness. Right? Uh, why layering? Why does brain use layering? Why, does, why, why should the architecture intelligence based on layers? It's been found through, and, and there's a mathematical reason for this, uh, and I'm not gonna cover that in this session, but it's been found that what layers allow you to do is aggregate information from the lowest level of resolution to the coarsest level. That is the first layer learns everything about changes in pixels and depth and color. The next layer kind of now learns how the contours, how the lines are made. The next layer actually learns about individual features. And the next layer actually learns about the holistic features, right? So layering actually allowed you to learn independent aspects or features or representation of the concept that you had to learn. And each of the layer actually learned things at different dimensions and at different depth. So far so good? We don't have to wait for Q&A till the end, right? Even though I'm gonna have Q&A at the end, please stop me and ask me questions. Now, go ahead. Layering is better than having no layers at all. Throwing all the neurons, like if you had a board, like literally throwing all the knobs in the first area. Like everybody just goes, if I have a million people, all of them are given a knob at the same time and they're all changing the knobs, right? Versus I have one room, people actually change the knobs and they're done. Information goes to the next room. Based on the information that's coming in, then the next set of people are changing the knobs. Because the first set of people are just saying, what's the color? What's the density? What's the depth? I do not know. Think about it as Amazon Mechanical Turk, right? No one room has information about everything. They only get some minor information. They are limited to some task that's being assigned to them, which is the first task for the first room, first layer, is to say, recognize the colors at the pixel level and make some uh, you know, uh, decision in terms of whether it's gonna be a line which goes from left to right, right to left, 
a contour, uh, whatever. That's all they're saying. They're saying, okay, I see that this is a you know, slanted line, diagonal line. That's all they are saying. And that information propagates. No, that's a beautiful question. Do, there's nothing that you'll hard code. In, for, in fact, the way you actually set up the neural network, the math, I'm gonna show you the math. The beauty of the math actually codes that information, the layers all by itself during the learning process. So you just set up these layers. Nobody's telling what should be in the first layer, second layer, third layer, fourth layer. You just set up these layers. You set up some math, which is what I'm gonna show you. And you let the network, you just take your hands off. You let the math and the neural network learn these features by itself. And after learning, you go and look into it. You will see that the first layer only learned about minor changes and handed over those minor changes to the next layer. And it kind of looked at how all those minor changes are connected and handed over to the next layer, which actually started looking at features, handed over to the next layer. And then that started putting it together. The, the, the beauty lies in the map, no, no hard coding. The, there is no actual science. Uh, machine learning and neural networks is actually a pragmatic science as against uh, pure math. Everything is applied math. There are thumb rules though, in terms of how to even set up how many parameters, how many neurons, how many layers, what happens when you set up these layers for a specific task, right? As we go in, in our lecture series, weeks and weeks, I'll actually start presenting the pros and cons and how to come up with these thumb rules, right? Does that answer your, your question? So basically layer tackle a limited amount of So the question is that we train it layer by layer on both emotions. We train them, so his question is, do we train it layer by layer or we train it do we train the neural network collectively together? We train the neural network collective, collectively together from the get-go. So we, we kind of have some conceptual idea about how the structure of the neural network works. We need to now also replicate the behavior. This is when I'll, I'll start slowly moving towards math. So please be with me. So far, so good, right? I promise you this is going to be fun. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Irene. <laughs> uh, millions of compute nodes as against one. In logistic regression, you have one compute node, single neuron. But in neural networks, each of this neural network is a logistic regression. If you know what logistic regression is, if not, it's okay. I'm going to let you know during this presentation. That's one thing which actually enables complex behavior. One node versus millions of small, tiny processing nodes, right? You're spreading the learning behavior across multiple nodes. All nodes are connected in some meaningful manner. Again, there are millions of variations of neural network architecture. There's no one right way to do this. What we're doing here is uh, primarily saying, okay, I'm gonna, this is called a feed forward neural network. I have, you know, uh, these many layers and each of this layer is only computing information that comes in and then forwarding that information to the next layer. This is called feed forward neural network or FFNN, okay? Uh, the, the, the processing function within that neural network is non-linear. Linear means you take an input and you make a change which is actually, you know, going up or down, like a line. Non-linear is anything which behaves this behavior. So this is linear behavior, the first one. Everything else is called non-linear. Non-linearity, if, 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 the, if, the, if all the layers were linear, then there is no complex behavior the neural network will ever learn. There is no, there is no, there is no power left. It's the non-linearity of the processing nodes, which actually forwards 
interesting, complex, creative behavior from one neural network to the next neural network. We'll come to that. Multi-layer to aggregate the learning. Positive weights should excite other neurons as you go forward. Negative weights should diminish or inhibit other neurons as you go forward. Activating or deactivating the neurons actually establishes neural pathways. So we should find some way to po send positive information forward or negative information forward. Everything's math, right? Chemical structures, electrical signals, everything's math. And it should be good at what brains are good at. Is it bad at what brains are bad at? We don't know, right? Is this by default pattern recognition, auditory signals, not yet common sense, but that's the fundamental premise. And it's been found that neural networks are not used for calculating integration or differentiation. You just use it for pattern recognition, you know, auditory sensor. So it's kind of good at what brains are good at because you replicate a structure, you replicate a behavior. It's kind of bad at what brains are bad at. So far, so good, guys. That's a neural science question. I have an answer, but the, the answer is a bit complex. The simplest answer is there is no such thing called memory. There is only such thing called neural pathways. Everything that you actually think exists in your brain, there is no like hard disk or RAM or any such things, right? The reason why elephant's brain is good at memory or uh, far more complex uh, activities than probably others is primarily because of total number of neurons in the elephant's brain which allows it to actually form a lot more neural pathways than other animals. But there are different types of memories as well, like short-term memory, long-term memory, the ability to use memory to actually form new memories, right? And the ability to actually creativity, right? That actually comes from different functions uh, called neocortex, uh, different, there, there's just no one single brain, right? There's so many, there's a reptilian brain, there's a mammalian brain, there is a neocortex and so on and so forth. The density of neurons in those actually adds more faculty to your, to your brain. Yeah, well, there is a, uh, a lot of the brain is dedicated to sense. Like, it's processing senses. Unfortunately, whales have smaller brains than elephants. Maybe they don't have to sense anything. But yeah, there, there are so many, so many theories, and that's, that's, um, that's uh, another good theory. Um, there's no theorems in science. There's only theories in science. Evolution is a theory, and that probably explains why elephants are smart in what they do. That said, I'm now going to shift towards math very soon. Uh, please, this is very important, not just for this series, but everything else I'm going to do going Friday. So if you have to go back and refresh math, do that after this. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to set up <laughs> Irene and Isabel. <laughs> you can't close your eyes. Isabel, hi. <laughs> Um, you can ask all these questions for, uh, uh, in the interview candidate and probably evaluate yourself. Uh, this slide is super important because I'm going to now talk about the fundamental concepts of what a deep neural network is made up of, the atomic unit. Can't emphasize enough. There is an, a, a layer of neurons or nodes that you set up in the first layer, right? That takes mathematical values, uh, like say pixels, which is numerical values. It's, uh, you know, it's a value between zero and one. It can be 0 0.03, 0 0.12, whatever. Doesn't matter, as inputs. We'll call that as X. And this is the neuron, right? Sorry, this is the neuron. This is the weight. Every, think about, the connection between, uh, are you able to see what I'm drawing? Yeah, you can. Uh, th think about the connection uh, between two nodes as an edge. The 
input to this neuron is some value. There is a function fx that this neuron will apply. We'll find out what this fun function is. That's called an activation function. There is an input, there is an activation function, and there is an output, which is a output of, the, of that function, which goes as an input for this neuron. If this is neuron i, this is neuron j, the output of this function, which is equal to, let's say, y i, becomes the input for this neuron j. But there is a weight w i j, which is a, a separate number, a different number. We'll call it a neural pathway number or the knowledge or the cattiness number, which connects neuron i to neuron j. So first of all, this is very important. And we, I'm going to lose you if you don't get this in all the next series and next lectures and next slides. There's a weight, there's an input, there's a function which actually calculates the input to say what should be the output. And there is a transfer potential, we'll call it a theta, right? Some transfer potential which actually works on. That's a summation function. That's a product of, I'm going to take input or, or, or the output of one neuron, multiply that with the weight, and forward that. That's called the transfer potential. So far, so good. Yeah. Okay, let me write what I. <laughs> okay, there is a function which is called the theta. I don't know how to erase it. I'm I'm new to this guy, so. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. I'm 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 going to present that more. Yeah. What color is better? Black. Red's better. Blue. Okay. That's better? Okay, fine. You'll, you, all those functions will be understood very quickly. Uh, so there is weights and inputs. The reason weights and inputs both are important is because let's think about, let's say, how the neural network is set up, right? While there is a node which is actually receiving x, i, or so let's say y i, that, that's what you were asking, uh, Irene. Let's say, I'll call this y i as an output of, so x i is an input for this neuron, right? x1, x2, x3, these are all different inputs. So this should be y1, y2, y3 as outputs. While this node actually gets y1, y2, y3 as inputs, which are all different, the same, information x2 is also passed across to let's say j1 j2 j3 neurons so this is i1 i2 i3 right this is layer i and there is layer j the same x2 which processed y2 y2 gets forwarded to j1 j2 j3 that is not very helpful that's not a very complex behavior Instead, if the weight of this pathway is different from the weight of this pathway, which is probably you know, somehow different from the weight of this pathway, even though your uh, y2 is the same, right? 
when you multiply that with weight i j which is weight i being 2 and j being 1 weight 2 1 weight 2 2 weight 2 3 right if those weights are different then the input which is theta which is called the transfer potential that you get for each of these nodes will be different even if the output of this neuron is the same so the the this can be like really heavy pathway for some reason we don't know this can be really light pathway this can be zero while the output is exactly the same that's another foundational element about deep neural networks where complexity in behavior is actually coming now there is input and output there are edges which has weights there is a transfer potential which is nothing but we'll call it a theta which is the output of the previous neuron times the weight of that edge so far so good are you guys following me these are simple maths and this will get really complex very soon W will be some weight. Yeah, so W on that way, so for I2 one That's the transfer potential, yes. That's the input. You can think about it that way. Theta is the input. So far, so good. You with me? All right, Sarah. Good question for a very simple vanilla neural network. So her question is, is the activation function the same for each layer or is it different? In this exercise and for most exercises, let's assume that the activation function is exactly the same. Every node will get the same equation for transfer potential, will have exactly the same activation function and will spit out some number. So we'll keep the equation the same, but the complexity comes by altering the numbers. That's called tuning. So far, so good. I still haven't exhibited what the activation function is. Activation function is where the power lies. This has to be non-linear. When it actually takes an input, and it spits out an output, it cannot be linear. What does linearity mean again? You know, if you move some direction this way, you proportionally move some direction this way in such a way that you're moving on a straight line. That's called linearity, correct? So far, so good. But non-linearity means you move some direction over here, but you don't proportionally, linearly move some direction this way. Instead, you move non-linearly. You cannot predict. So this can be like this. This can be like this exponential. This can be kind of, you know, an asymptote which goes like that. That is called non-linearity, right? So the activation function is expected to be non-linear, which is where all the power of neural network lies. Same output for every neuron, but weights differ for the edges. And there should be some error function in the end to say how far or close are we towards the truthiness, towards the truthhood of what we are uh, computing. Are you guys with me so far? What does it mean? That means that eventually, let's say the final neuron is only one neuron, right? Uh, let's say the target value that I'm expecting is 10 in the final neuron. When the final neuron spits out a number, I expect the value 10. 
That's called the target function when you're training it. But I might get values yj equals 9 or yj equals 8 or yj equals 7 or 11. It doesn't matter. And the error is very simple. tj minus yj. This is an error. This is called an actual error. So far so good. Now we're going to use an error function where we do not calculate the error for every iteration of training. We're going to group. We're going to say, okay, I'm going to run 10 or 20 iterations. That is first, I'm going to send an input value. I'm going to look at the output value and I'm going to keep the error. I'm not going to train the new neural, uh, neural network back to say, no, I'm not going to tell the neural network that, uh, you know, you're, you're guessing higher or lower. I'm going to keep it in a, in a vector, in a list. I'm going to bunch a group of errors. And then I'm going to say, you know, your error on an average is above or below. Okay. Because the in different inputs actually produces different errors. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to ha have a error function. It's called error sum, sum squared, right? Which is, a bunch of errors that I group. That is, I'm going to say, first take the actual error, find the difference, square the difference to amplify the negativity or positivity, and sum all of that in every iteration. Reduce that to half. It can, you can reduce that to uh, 1 divided by n as well. But let's say reduce that to half, and give that as an input. Input to who? input back to the neural network to say you're off by this number. So far, so good. So that's called an error function. But we need to actually also have a feedback loop function to actually say, what am I going to do with this error? How am I going to apply it back to the neural network? So typically, we want to go back and change those knobs, right? We're going to say, oh, the error is way off. I'm going to take that information. I'm going to change the knobs again. That function is called gradient descent. Now, the, the functions for transfer potential are here. We understood that transfer potential is nothing but the input times the weight. So far, so good, guys. The transfer potential is the input that the next layer neuron takes from the previous layer. That's a product, summation of the product of the output from the previous layer or the first input, which is the pixel and some weight. So far, so good. That's called a transfer potential. That's remember this equation. This is a simple equation, right? Sum of the product of Xi Wi. The activation function, oh Jesus. I don't know what I did there. Uh, is the function on this transfer potential, which should be nonlinear and it should also be differentiable. I'll tell you why it has to be differentiable. Differentiation or it should, you should be able to compute a derivative. Over here, I'm using a simple logistic sigmoid for this exercise. It can be really complex. A logistic sigmoid, this is the equation for the logistic sigmoid. It takes an exponent minus theta, you know, raised to the power of minus theta in that manner to actually produce nonlinearity. Non Logistic sigmoid has a curve like this, right? Uh, it is uh, either zero or it is one. It goes from zero to one and it switches somewhere in between. So that means there is a thresholding function. It'll keep saying I'm zero, I'm zero, I'm zero, I'm zero, I'm zero for some value of X. Bef you know, the value of y will, will be zero. And slowly, y will actually increase. And then suddenly switch over saying, I'm one, I'm one, I'm one, I'm one. That means activate, activate, activate. For a long time, it'll be saying, no, don't activate, don't activate. Independent, and, and it'll keep having the threshold for that chemical signal in your brain. But suddenly it switches over. That's why logistic sigmoids are beautiful because it, you, it quickly switches over and it'll stay on one for a long time. Or it switches over and stay on zero for a long time, right? Uh, the error function we already saw. So far, so good. I'm going to increase the math. Go ahead. Sorry, 
Once you set up the neural network, you don't change the activation function at all. But before choosing, so what are the things that can change? Your transfer potential function can change. There's no reason why this has to be a product. Yesterday, I think we were having another, this can be a radial basis function. This can be a sombrero function. This can be something crazy that you can think of as long as you have a way to mix the input and the weight in a manner that is, that gives you numerical stability. This is called numerical conditioning of a network. You, in, in research, you can change any equation in research and find the stability of the network. Overall, the network should be stable, right? Simpler things are better. And this is the simplest that you can think of. There are other ways to actually change the transfer potential. There are simpler and more complex activation function. This is the simplest. We say, hey, we understand this can be linear regression, but as soon as this becomes linear regression, there's no power. It has to be nonlinear. And we say, okay, the simplest nonlinearity that I can introduce, there is one more called uh, you know, rectified linear units, either that or this, and I'm gonna stick to the simplest. And the simplest error function to group all the errors and provide that information back is a you know, error sum of squared. So I'm just using the simple functions now. But in, in research, you can throw in whatever equations that you want to, provided that the network is behaving in a very stable manner. Other activation functions, binary step function. Is that nonlinear? The answer is yes. But unlike a sigmoid, it suddenly switches. It goes to the threshold, bumps up like a freaking stock that just dropped up or down, or don't even ask, um, and then go, you know, stays there overnight. Or a hyperbolic tan, which unlike, a, it, it has the same shape of a sigmoid if you notice, but sigmoids are like this between zero or one. A hyperbolic tan goes from minus one to one. And that information is also helpful in certain areas where you're not switching between zero to one as an output, you wanna go from negative one to positive one as an output, which significantly inhibits the activation of the next. So it's not only you're saying zero, don't activate, you're saying negative one, oh, I wanna kill you. You should not exist in the pathway. In the brain, neurons, when you're born, it's not like it just stays there. Neurons die, neurons create, neural pathways changes. I mean, mostly the neural pathways that you have actually trained. Practice actually makes neural pathways stronger. Similarly, if you wanna not just inhibit, you wanna actually diminish, then you, you wanna send an input minus one. Rectified linear units goes from zero and boom, it just can go to infinity. While all of this are staying at one, rectified linear, linear units can go outside the graph. Right? Uh, exponential linear unit is similar to recti rectified linear unit, but it's leaky, as in it can go to negative. So these are all other activation functions that you can use. So far, so good? Okay, I'm gonna bump up the math a little. So are you with me <laughs> till now? Sure? Let's understand the sigmoid a little, why that activation function is in, uh, useful. It's a probability function. It can have a probability between zero and one, mostly towards zero or mostly towards one, but there is interesting gradient over there before it actually switches from zero to one. And this is what is quite interesting. This space, while you wanna inhibit or activate, this space over here is also very interesting about logistic sigmoids. Is differentiable. And I keep saying that this function is not just nonlinear, it has to be differential. It has to be differential. Activation function has to be. I'll tell you why very soon. Is symmetric in its representation to the left and its right. So it's kind of predictable. It brings stability. Symmetry always brings stability. And it also contains the nonlinearity while it's differentiable. The threshold is midpoint. You know where the threshold is. It'll switch over symmetrically 
at some midpoint. There is always a midpoint. When you apply a bias, you can actually move this in a very meaningful way to the left or the right. That's the beauty of logistic sigma, because it's symmetrical, it, it has a threshold. When you apply a bias as a function, you can actually move the entire curve to the left or the right. That's the beauty of logistic sigmoids, right? It's easier to understand, okay. Used in logistic regression, so why not, right? So, what we're trying to do is millions of small regressions in a neural network instead of one big logistic regression. Why are we doing it? Because we wanted to guess the weight. And the weight has an error. And the error can be extremely positive on one side, it can go to zero and extremely negative one on, extremely negative on one side, go to zero, extremely positive on other side, right? And the errors can actually demonstrate either a quadratic, this is a quadratic error, or it can be multimodal, as in if there is only one weight that I'm asking you to guess, you can exhibit a quadratic behavior. Like I said, guess a number, you went from 102, 50, 4, 20, boom. That's just one number, right? So that will be a quadratic. You can go from negative to positive. But if you have millions and millions of errors, your curve, you, you, can't, you cannot visualize the curve, but let's say if you have three dimensional errors, then the contours is not just in one area. It can be you know, in many areas and you need to find the zero, the lowest, uh, area in that three-dimensional curve. So this is a two-dimensional curve. You want to find the lowest where error actually runs to zero. But over here, in all the dimensions, you're looking for a minimal point, right? How do we actually do this? In, in, our, in our example, what we did was we jumped. We started with some number. We said 102. Then we said, you know, probably we, we went to 50. Suddenly we went to, you know, four before we came to 20, right? You can first keep jumping. These are large ways to actually converge before you actually say the value is 20. Or you can, if you know what the error is, if it's 102, you can say, is it 101? Because nobody's telling me, you know, telling me anything differently. Is it 101? No. All I'm saying is no, it's high. Is it 100? Is it 90? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You can also do that. You can do the, sorry, what did I do? I need help. Okay. Now this is called step functions. You can apply large step functions. You can apply small step functions. So far so good. Now, there is something, does everybody understand derivatives? I might need 15 more minutes. Are you guys okay with this? By the show of hands, how many guys are okay with 15, 20 minutes? Okay, good. It's Friday, come on, we're having fun. Uh, rise over run, have you heard about that? If I want to find the small change in delta, from this place to this place, x and y, we say y by x rise over run is the derivative. A gradient is, so rise over run works only when you have two dimensions. As soon as you have three dimensions, you call it a gradient. When you have more than one you know, a parameter, which is actually affecting your uh, rise over run, then you don't call it a derivative, you call it as a gradient. So far so good? Okay. Our objective is to find this and we have to actually use differential calculus to do that. And to do that, let's look at a function that we apply, a learning function called back propagation. Back propagation means feedback. That means there was some value yj 
right? There was a target tj. When you say tj minus yj, you get an error. If the error is big or small, I want to propagate that back to this weight, back to this weight, back to this yj, in such a way that I change this y weight to go up or down by very small proportion, so that the next run, I relook at the value yj. That is called back propagation, right? Now, to guess the correct weights, we need a feedback loop to scale the weights. The hidden activities i, this is a hidden layer, this is an input layer, this is an output layer. The hidden activities actually affect the output layer. We need an error derivative to compute the rate of change for the value w to make that change up or down and go back and ask the question saying, hey, are we good yet? Are we good yet, right? That is called back propagation. Now to compute that, <laughs> we have to do some math. Are you guys good so far? Because everything, I'm gonna quickly do math and finish this so that we can get to question answers. Good so far? One of the things we learned, we had a transfer potential theta, which was equal to, anybody? Sum of? So some uh, x or y i and w i. Let's look at the math behind this in terms of the change in theta with respect to y would be w i. That is, if you, if you know the differential calculus, the only thing that matters is this constant right now, you retain the constant as yi. Similarly, if you want to know the change in wi, that is yi. The summation doesn't matter because we are only lo looking at with respect to i. If i is one, i being two, three, four, five, six doesn't matter because those are all constants with respect to a wi or a yi. So the summation becomes meaningless. Everything in the sum becomes zero. And the only thing that matters is the coefficient of that derivative. Simple? Remember this math? Okay. So we'll remember this as one. If you want to note it down, note it down because I don't have space uh, in the next sections. I'll find out a way to actually snapshot this. Nathan's going to help me. But for now, you just have to remember this. Now, this is the first equation, right? Then I said error equals sum of the output square. So far so good. This is what I said the error function is. If I want to change, if I want to know what's a small error differential, I'm saying this is a partial derivative. This is not D. This is a partial derivative because there's a T, which is a target value, and there's a Y, which is the parameter with respect to which I want to find the change in error. So I would say partial derivative of error E with respect to the change in output yj. Tell me what, how, what is the change in error with respect to the change in yj as a small change in error? So far so good. That's the question I'm asking, which is this two comes here, two, 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 two and two gets cancels out. So, Good. So this is nothing but minus tj minus yj. This is two. So we'll remember these two equations. So in equation one, derivative of theta with respect to yi will be the weight, derivative of the weight will be yi. In equation two, the derivative of error with respect to the output yj will be minus target value minus yj. So far, so good. Will you remember this? 
Okay, now math gets a little bumped up. We have to find the derivative of the activation function before we come up with any, before we find that the derivative for the weight, we have to say freaking hell, we have an, not only a summation function, we not only have an error, we not only have to ca calculate that with respect to the outputs, I also have an activation function. That's why activation functions has to be differentiable. So far so good. So I have some activation function y, which is one by this sigmoid, right? Which can also be written as minus one, right? So far, simple math, everything simple. Now I wanna do dy by d theta. This is not a partial derivative. This is, there is no multiple, this, this, this differential calculus. There's no multiple variables, right? E is an exponent, it's not a variable. It's think about exponent as a function. So how do we go about doing this? This is, what do we get? Minus E minus theta, one plus E minus theta minus two, right? Which can also be returned as, so this is, uh, sorry, uh, minus one, which can also be written as one plus E minus theta whole square. Now, I can also write this as one by one plus E to the power of minus theta multiplied by E to the power of minus theta by one plus E to the power of minus theta. So far so good? It's important you follow me. But this is y. So I can also write it as y e to the power of minus theta by one plus e to the power of minus theta. I'm trying to find the value for the differential output for y with respect to y by using y, which makes math very simple when you actually get to the end state. But we need to still solve for this because this suddenly looks like eh, still a lot of exponential functions, still a lot of complexity. So what do we do? I'll solve for e minus theta by one plus e minus theta. A simple trip for this is I'll add and negate. When I add one and, uh, and, de and uh, delete one, it's the same. The equation is the same, right? I can kind of move it to this and immediately do a, a simple trick. Are these the same? Following? This is one. So I'll get one minus one by one plus e to the power of minus theta. But what is one plus one? What is this again? This is y. So previously, from previous function, I had y. And from here, I'm getting one minus y. Do you remember what we did in the previous step? We reduced it to one by, so we had y times some complex number, the complex number we solved. So the beauty about sigmoids is when you differentiate it and look for the simplest behavior of it, it's y one minus y. You can go back. Yeah, yeah sorry. It's not, y cannot be equal to y times one minus y. The, the delta, thank you. Uh, Irving is getting back to me. Um, <laughs> so far, so good, guys. Are you able to follow me? That's why I'm doing math step by step so that I don't just, boom, here's, you know, differentiation of a sigmoid is y, one minus y. You, need, you, now, you now know why. Okay, now we got the activation function out of the way as well, right? What we need to learn now is to say, how do we compute the derivative or the delta or the change in the weight that is required? You cannot directly get to the weight. You first have to compute. So if the, if the setup is such a way that I have a yj, I have a transfer potential theta j, I have a yi, I have a weight wij between two neurons. The first thing I'm gonna compute is what is 
a partial derivative of the error, I want to know a small change in error with respect to a change in transfer potential. That's what I'm trying to first compute before trying to propagate it back, it, back to the weight. I want to use the chain rule. How many people know chain rule? No, people out of college fresh are not the only one who should know about chain rule. Come on, what's the chain rule? Correct. How far away are you from college, guys? <laughs> so I'm going to use chain rule to say the way to identify the error, uh, I don't know, uh, the way to identify the error for the transfer potential is first to identify the error for output. And I'm going to apply chain rule where I'm going to take the output with respect to the transfer potential. This is, this is called a chain rule because of this. So far so good? <laughs> Irene, I know you're following, but I, I'm not sure about other people. <laughs> Are you with me guys? No? Yes? Okay. Uh, did we compute Any part of this in the previous steps? We computed this, right? Did we also compute this? This we got as, we know what the error is. Right, do you remember this? We, we, we did this step five minutes back. What was this? Why was uh, sigmoid, right? Correct yj, one minus yj. So I have the change in error with respect to the transfer potential as my first step. Easy to compute. I just have the target value, I have the output. I'm gonna just use the target values and the outputs to find the differential or the, or the change in error with respect to the transfer potential. I don't need complex equations, so I simplified it. I used chain rule to simplify this. So this is one thing that we have to remember in this step is one. Now I can get to wij where I'm going to say compute the error and find that error with respect to the weight for this layer, the previous, that is immediate layer. That is, we are always going to compute the error de 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 uh, deviations from the output towards the front layers, right? So the way this can be done is I partial derivative again by chain rule. I'm gonna first find the error derivative to the transfer potential. I'm gonna take the transfer potential and say what's the change of the transfer potential with respect to the weight. Uh, did any of this, did we compute any of this? First one's right here. What about the second one? Why I? We computed that the first time. We said, you know what, transfer potential is sum of, you know, Wij, Yi. Uh, if I actually look at uh, Wij, the only thing that will be left is Yi. We did this, right? So we have this over here times Yi. In other words, I have minus yi, yj, one minus yj, tj minus yj. Beautiful, very simple. Now I don't have complex numbers to calculate gradients. I calculate the gradients based on end output, internal intermediary outputs from the hidden layer, the immediate hidden layer and the target function that I'm actually trying to supervise it towards that I want target function to be 10. We, we'll call this delta W. 
So, so far so good. So, we just have to say that at any given point of time, learning is nothing but at some time step t. This we already found out in the previous section. So we need to say, I have a value wij in my equation based on how far or close my guess is towards a target function. I will apply a small change. It can be positive or negative, I don't know, to my wij, to my weight in such a way that in the next iteration, my error is reducing is converging. That's all that we have to know. Right? But you also need to know in a multi-layer neural network, how do I propagate this to the previous one? For which you need to be able to compute the gradient change required for the output of the hidden layer. Chain rule again. This is going to be sum of all j's. Can you tell me why it has to be sum of all j's? Because there is more than one J. Oh, Jesus, what did I do? Not now. J1, J2, J3. The same YI is actually going into J1, J2, J3, J4, J5. So you need sum of all J's. And the transfer potential for every single J, J1, J2, J3, theta J. For the same yi, or oh, what happened again? Come on. To be computed. The output might be yi, but it's spreading itself into multiple neurons. So hence the transfer potential is going to change and the weights of each of that is different. So you have to actually use the transfer potential of every j to compute for i. That gets a little complex, right? But we already know that this is, this was computed in the previous step. Right? If you remember, do you know what it is? So let's assume it was computed in the previous step. And this is nothing but wij. So you, once you know, and in, in the previous sections, you already knew what wij was, the delta and the wij. Once you know the wij, you can actually easily compute yi. Once you know yi, you can actually compute this w. That's how back propagation works, where you actually use the target function, you use the output, you use the input as the simple equations post solving the differential calculation to keep changing the values. Now, if you have a neural network, which is like this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end this and I think I'm, you guys also need to go and do some math. Uh, if you have a neural network like this, uh, let's say, you know, the output function is just one neuron. The weight calculation will be extremely high in this layer. And because of this setup, the change that is propagating, all, all the changes, this is called stochastic gradient descent. When you actually have multi-layered network, you say, okay, calculate the gradient. Most of the gradients, the up or down will actually happen in this layer. And then it, when you try to propagate it, if this is you know, big changes like 10, this will be changes like four. This will be changes like uh, one, up or down in terms of an exponent. So the, the more you do, what happens is, because of the setup, the changes in the first layer will become smaller and smaller and smaller in iterations. And eventually it'll vanish. When there is no more learning happening in W in any of the layer that, and that layer becomes static, you say that the network is not learning. That problem is called vanishing gra gradient problem. What happened? The gradient 
that you need to change, that you need to propagate, saying, make this amount of change. In the first, the, the, all the change that you're pro pro proposing in a stochastic gradient descent, somehow there'll be large changes. You know, the first, the, the, the last layer will be doing something like this. If it does something like this, the next layer does something like this. The next layer does something like this, right? As and when this becomes smaller, the first layer will not change at all. It'll just, it'll just be doing this. It's trying to balance itself and there's no learning. And no learning is not good because all learning is trying to happen in the last layer. That problem is called vanishing gradient problem. There is an opposite problem for that, which is also called exploding gradient problem. Remember this in the next series, I'm gonna cover that. There are other problems as well. Stochastic gradient descent. Where does the gradient lie? Only in this section. There is no gradient here, this is zero. There is no gradient, nothing, nothing goes up or down. When nothing goes up or down, there is no, nothing to learn. There's no gradient over here. So it is zero. There's a probability that because the network is stuck in one of these asymptotes, the network is not learning. There is also other problems in neural networks where you're making so many changes to the weights that eventually you might actually run down a neuron, a value of a neuron to zero. And you might land up having so many zeros in your network. And the summation function zero times anything is zero. The summation function has no information. It doesn't matter what your weight is. If your output is zero, the summation is zero. So that's why the summation function is also always not a good way to solve it. You add a bias to the summation function. You say uh, theta equals sum of wi plus some bias in such a way that the gradient doesn't vanish. 